advanced technical analysis, Brian Caprice from Keep Trading Simple, and trying to put the odds in your favor. Brian, it is all you. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. I know you guys have been here for a good majority of the day, and uh, I'll try to instill enough energy and excitement to keep everybody um, focused. Uh, technical analysis is one of those things that some people absolutely love it. They can't get enough of it. They want more of it. Uh, even when they figure it out, they add double and triple and, and four times trying to get more out of it. Some people look at this and, you know, I think it's the type A personality that just wants to get in there and do it. And unfortunately, technical analysis and, and you know, it can get a little bit, you know, they just want to hit buy and sell without kind of the analysis behind it because it takes work. So the session today is really talking about odds. So for those of you that attended the sessions in, in, in the morning or uh, previous education summit meetings, you guys know that I'm not really the big indicator based guy. Right. Um, I have a lot of I don't know. I don't want to say harsh opinions, um, but I feel that technical analysis is extremely important. Uh, I'm a technical based trader. You guys know I'm big into supply and demand and price action. But understanding indicators out there and really any type of an edge that you can get is really kind of the name of the game in trading. Now, with that said, you know, I understand how to use technical analysis uh, as far as technical indicators go. Uh, it is very beneficial when you know what the average Joe is looking at and trying to do and in most times using things the wrong way. Now, uh, a lot of these systems that exist out there, whether it be technical analysis systems or price action systems, a lot of times they need confirmation from something else. Well, today I'm going to talk about um, one kind of advanced technical analysis uh, indicator and really kind of system because it's not really just one. It's There's multiple things, and then I'm actually going to give you a couple strategies and variations on it itself about how to kind of stack the odds in your favor. Uh, and I say odds, you know, trading is not gambling, but you can stack the odds in your favor, in, in my opinion, um, by again, doing kind of what the big money is doing out there and knowing what the masses are doing. Because at the end of the day, it's a market, right? If you want to buy something, somebody's got to be willing to sell it and vice versa. If you're trying to get out of a position, you're hitting sell and you're hoping that somebody's hitting buy on the other side of it, right? So knowing what the masses are, are doing are extremely important. OK, so before I can dive into the actual, uh, you know, the slides and dive into really kind of the indicator that I'm going to talk about today, we do need to cover a, a risk disclaimer. All right. Uh, you guys may have heard this once or twice before. You may have heard it today, but I have to make sure I read it because it's different um, recordings. But trading on Nadex involves risk and may not be appropriate for all investors. Trading can be volatile and investors risk losing the cost and other transaction, including fees. Now, the information presented within this presentation is for informational and education purposes only and should not be considered an offer or solicitation to, bell, to sell any financial instrument on Nadex or elsewhere. Any trading decisions that you make are solely your responsibility and at your own risk. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Nadex contracts are based on underlying asset classes, including Forex, stock index futures, and commodity futures. Uh, Nadex is a registered trademark of the IG Group. All right, so click it, get the nice little fancy animation in there. All right, so here's the uh, agenda we're, we're going to cover today. So. First thing I'm going to talk about, what are Bollinger Bands? Um, I believe that it is probably one of the, I don't want to say smartest, but that's for lack of a better word. I believe it's one of the smartest indicators that was ever created. Um, there are a lot of indicators out there. A lot of people use them the wrong way. Um, this is one of those ones that it's really kind of hard to argue with what it's showing you. All right. Um, and it is adaptive, which I think is important to bring up. And I'll cover what that means in a, in a few minutes and why why it was so important to have something, an indicator that was adaptive. Then I'm going to talk about kind of stage two, okay? Uh, there's something called Bollinger Band widths and percent B, and this is where it gets to be a little bit more advanced. A lot of people know what a Bollinger Band is. It's pretty much in every single charting platform that exists, but not a lot of people are using the band widths or the percent B. This is kind of like, wait, what is that? Hmm? What, what is this new? So a lot of people don't know how to use them. And I actually feel that uh, in general, I actually kind of like these two, even in some cases, more than Bollinger Bands. And then what I'll do is we'll talk about overlapping systems, how you can use either the Bollinger Bands, the BBW, uh, BBW, or the percent %B, and combine them with other strategies like you're supposed to, to increase your odds inside of the market. And then we'll go into how do you tweak the default. So this is where it gets actually really fun. There's a lot of things you could do. And, and Throughout the years, one of my favorite things, like uh, it used to be years ago, you know, you would tell people, they, they, they would always want to know what's the best indicator, right? And everybody was always like, oh, the MACD, you got to use it. I was like, well, how do you create the MACD? Can, tell, me the, tell me the components that are used to build the MACD so you can tell me exactly what it's showing you and why it's showing it to you. 
and I don't know, presenting to 10, 15,000 people, um, not one person knew actually what the components were to actually build the MACD. They knew what it was. They knew what it was supposed to tell them to do, but not a single person knew all the components to how to build it. And I thought that was absolutely hysterical. I was in New York City um, at the time, and I don't even know the true number, but it's definitely over 10,000 people um, in, the, in the years that I was up there. And they just, nobody knew. So when you understand how it's built, now all of a sudden you can start tweaking in the defaults based off your personality structure, like your, the way that your personality is, the way that you see charts, like your risk analysis. And now you can even make them better than they were designed before because now they're like custom-made indicators for you, which are also standard. So that's going to be a fun chart. That's going to be a fun section too. And then last but not least, if we have time, um, I'm going to go into charts and we'll kind of show you uh, how to find these. Uh, I'm not actually going to use Nadex charts today. I'm going to use TradingView, but Nadex has them as well. They're, you know, Bollinger Bands are definitely on there, but they don't have as many customization options. So I want to make sure I showed you in something that was free that everybody has access to. So I'm going to go over there and show you how to do it. All right. So let's dive in. First things first, what are Bollinger Bands? And, and what, is, what is a Bollinger at the end of the day, right? Everybody's like, huh, who's that? Well, Bollinger is actually a guy, okay? Uh, John Bollinger is an extremely smart, if you've ever heard the guy talk, um, he is 100%, he is a mathematician. He, uh, I, I, you know, this is kind of a joke, and again, I know he's not listening today. Um, he is alive, though he is alive. That's one of his jokes. He says, I'm still alive. Um, <laughs> he's kind of like the dry eye guys. Right. He doesn't have a lot of pitch in his voice and it's very kind of monotone at the same pace. Um, probably a million times smarter than me. Uh, but again, to listen to him sometimes gets a little bit hard. But basically, Bollinger Bands are something that and again, he didn't even name them that he, he created this tool in the 1980s. All right. Uh, as you see here, they arose for the need for an adaptive trading band and an observation that volatility was dynamic, not static. So basically what this means is a lot of the tools that we had in the market that we create kind of like a top and bottom, like a channel. Right. A lot of them were not necessarily, um, they were they were static. They were based off a solid number. They were not changing. And what he realized was the markets are constantly changing, right? If you look at the VIX, it goes up and down all day long, right? It's a, a you know, gauge of volatility based off the yes. How can you have a tool that is not changing with what's happening right now? And this is one of the biggest problems with indicators, right? Most of them are all lagging. By the time something happens, you're already too late. And it's what most of you know, technical expert experts never tell you that 99 percent of the time you're using Medicaid it's already too late and you're getting in well after you should have right that's why i mean that's why i'm more of a supply and demand trader because it's an if this then that i don't need to wait for 12 confirmations i'm already in and i could be getting out when you're getting in because of the delay that indicators provide right so he created a way to create bands a top and a bottom a channel right that were adaptive with current market conditions now they delay a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. A little bit. Right. But one of the additional things that he has in there is because they are adaptive, they are applying statistics. Okay. I'm a very, very big believer in everything in life. I don't care what you're doing. Statistics is the way to get ahead, right? The more odds you stack in your favor, could you be Han Solo and rely on luck at all times? Sure. But he is also a fictional character. At the end of the day, if we talk about odds and statistics, go out to Vegas. They make plenty of money, right? You know, that, 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 that roulette wheel, right, where they spin the ball around, right? Everybody loves that game, right? Is it going to go red or black, right? Well, they threw the little kind of uh, craziness in there and threw that one, that one green, you know, circle, the zero, right? That all of a sudden stacked the odds in the favor uh, of the casino. And then some places have a zero and a double zero. There's two of them that stack the odds even more in their favor, right? If you sit there long enough, they will win because that's what the odds will tell you. And that's what that's what statistics are. And, and again, that's one of the things that Bollinger Bands is great about. Now, one of the other cool things about Bollinger Bands is they apply to every single market, right? Every financial market out there, equities, Forex, commodities, futures. You can even use it in crypto, right? So it's really, really cool that it's one of these tools that literally works in everything, right? The other nice thing is it can be used on almost every single time frame. Okay. You can use it for short day scalping. You can use it for middle day or intraday trading. You can use it for hourly, daily, weekly, monthly swing trades, long-term positions. It works for all of them. So it's one of those tools that's not just a, you know, like, you know, you see all these people like the, the new latest and greatest right now. Everybody loves the volume weighted average, right? The VO app stuff. Guess what, guys? It's all lagging, right? You, you think you can see like this inside data. Unfortunately, 99.9% 9 .9 of the data we get is all falling behind. 
this is one of those systems that actually does a pretty good job of showing you where volatility exists, where volatility doesn't, what direction things are moving in. And one of the nice things is it actually can give you strength and direction, which again, if you look at a lot of the indicators out there, right? Oh, they're going to tell me oversold or overbought, or they're going to tell me the strength of a trend. Well, guess what? They don't give you the whole picture. And actually, this system actually does do both, uh, which is something that you really don't see too often, right? Now, maybe everyone, all right, what is it? What is it? Tell me tell me more. I've seen it. I kind of know a little bit about it. Bollinger Bands, are, they're actually very, very simple, right? I mean, on its most basic level, it is three bands, right? There's a moving average, and everybody will always ask, well, is it simple or is it EMA, right? Because EMAs, they're, they're better. No, he used uh, a simple moving average, right? Took it over a 20-day, and it says 20-day, but it's a 20-period because it, it could be on any time frame. And what it does is it takes a standard, uh, actually two standard deviations above and below. Now, you may say, I have no idea what a standard deviation is or why it's important, and that would be a great question. I'm going to cover that on the next slide. But all you have to understand is, if you click Bollinger Band, you're going to get these three lines. And in the line in the middle, it's a moving average, a simple moving average, something that we are taught in grade school. It's the one thing in trading that we're actually taught. How do you create an average? Very simple, right? You take 20 periods, you add them all up, you divide them by 20, and bam, there you go. In the EMA, the only difference with the EMA is there's a higher weighting for more near-term price than the old ones, where a simple, all 20 get the same weighting, right? Very simple, two standard deviations, bam, you guys are now, you know, you guys are a master at this. Now, now let's go into the, why the standard deviation aspect of it now. What does that mean? All right, so there is a little trick on here, and the next slide will actually explain why the breakout doesn't quite match the chart on the left, okay? The chart on the left is true statistics, okay? If you have, if you have a, a, a result, right, one standard deviation will cover about 68% of the occurrences that happen. Two standard deviations will cover 95. Three standard deviations, 99.7% of the time, data will stay with it will stay within those three points. And it's not just this; it's statistics in general. It's everywhere, right? So if you kind of turn this sideways, it looks more like a chart. But this is a bell curve. We've all been taught about bell curves, right? We all know about bell curves, right? Talk about that area under the curve. There's all kinds of math and stuff with it. But what you have to understand is, as far as statistics goes. If you're able to say that price should stay within this range about 95% of the time, is that a powerful tool? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Especially because if it breaks out, we know that that is an absolute rare occurrence. It absolutely shouldn't do that. And if you believe in the law of averages, which I absolutely do, again, averages are you know the sum of a bunch of prices together, right? A rare freak occurrence can't happen a lot, right? So. Knowing when, when things have changed or gone beyond what they should, that's a big telltale sign that something's going to happen. Because, again, that's why we have averages. So that's why it's so important. Now, again, if you figured it out, it says 95 there. But on the slide, it says approximately 90% of price action occurs between these two bands. Any break above or below the bands is a major event. The breakout itself is not the trading signal, right? The mistake that most people make is believing that the price hitting or exceeding one of the bands is a signal to buy or sell. Breakouts provide no clue as a direction in the extent of future price movement. Again, it's not a crystal ball, but all of a sudden it's now telling you, man, we are outside of the norm. This is never, this is, you know, this is not supposed to happen. And again, it provides the opportunity, right? And this is where kind of the overlapping aspect of it comes in. Now, and you're looking at this, you're saying 9590. All right, Brian's office rocker. His spelling is not great. He can't type. Bam. Okay. Same chart. This is part of Bollinger's uh, Bollinger Band's 22 rules. So it's on his website. You guys can go check it out, BollingerBands.com, Bollinger-Band-Rules. This is what I mean by John is uh, quite the engineering dry eye guys type. You know, he has 22 rules, okay? Now, this is what he says, number 14. Make no statistical assumptions based on the use of standard deviation calculation in the construction of the bands. The distribution of security prices is non-normal and not tip and, and the and the typical so sample size is not is what or is what most um, um, deployments of Bollinger Bands is too small. Basically, there's not enough of the occurrences to get a statistically significant result. In practice, we typically find 90%, not 95% of the data inside the Bollinger Bands with the with default parameters. What he's saying is, yes, the the, the tried and true math. Two standard deviation encompasses 95%, but what they found is 99 or 90% of price action 
stays within these bands. Now, you may say, why the difference? That goes back to the adaptive feature of this, right? It's constantly being calculated. It's constantly being changed around. The moving average is constantly changing. So in all fairness, 90% is still absolutely amazing. The fact that if it goes outside of the bands, that only can happen 10% of the time. Most of the time, 90% of the time, it's going to stay within these two standard deviations, right? Um, and again, because of the adaptive nature, that's why it doesn't work. All right. So that's kind of where we're sitting with it, right? So one of the strategies, now again, this is, uh, I, I guess, one of the main strategies that Bollinger really started, started with. Uh, it was called the squeeze strategy. All right. Now, in looking at this picture, and I think, I think you guys can see a blue dot. I think it allows that. I'm not sure if it carries through or not, but what I'm looking at is the orange box. Okay. A squeeze occurs when price has been moving, uh, you know, moving aggressively and then starts to go sideways. Consolidation. So we all know what consolidation is, right? We know by looking at this that the orange line in the middle, right, the middle line is always a moving average. Okay, always a moving average. The outer two lines, what are those? Two standard deviations from the average. Now, as we see price get small, right, you can see right where that orange box is, it, it doesn't move much, right? It goes up a little bit, goes down a little bit. What does it do? The bands, because it's not moving around that much, the bands are really starting to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. They're called, it's called the squeeze strategy, right? What happens with one, this is one of Bollinger's kind of strategies. When you have a close outside of the band, showing us that, hey, listen, there's, there's something going on. And again, it requires the squeeze to actually exist. As they're starting to expand, it means, you know what? We had a period of extremely low volatility, and now we have some type of driving factor, driving force in there, that is moving price, okay? By closing outside of it, remember 90% of price action should occur within those bands. The second it closes outside in this kind of squeeze strategy, it's showing you that, man, now there's power, it's breaking out, you know, the trend is increasing in that direction because it was able to break out of that 90% area. And typically in this one, again, is this the best strategy in the world? Um, no, it's not the highest probability, but it is one that absolutely works. And with the correct money management, it's definitely something that could be beneficial for you, right? But, you know, typically in this situation, you look at the other side of the consolidation, that's where you put your stop loss. And in, in, in this example, you can see right where the arrow is, we'd be the close. And you can see you just ran, 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 ran. And again, it doesn't matter what this is. Um, but this was a pretty nice run to the downside off of that one. And that's what, you know, that's the squeeze strategy. And it's understanding why did the two outer lines come in? Because there was consolidation, right? There's not a lot of volatility. It's shrinking. And all of a sudden, if it starts to go out again, it tells you it's game on, right? Game on. And that would be a squeeze strategy using Bollinger Bands. Now, again, very, very simple. Now, here's the limitations, okay? That is one of the things that Bollinger talks about. But what he does is he gives us a little bit of a warning. And, and most people, they literally will look at this and say, oh, we, 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 hit the, we hit the outside. That's it. We got to get in, right? What he says is Bollinger Bands are not a standalone trading system, right? They're simply one indicator designed to provide traders with information regarding price volatility, right? John himself suggests using two or three other non-correlated indicators that provide more direct market signals. He believes it is crucial to use indicators based on different types of data. One of the things that John says that I think is absolutely awesome, if you're using, and this is this is a mistake, this is one of the reasons why I also I don't use indicators a lot. Um, if I use them, it's for a confirmation. A lot of people love these fancy names, right? I'm going to use RSI, so that's XMACD. Using one momentum indicator is fine. Using two momentum indicators is not going to make you right more often than not. Okay, It'll only give you mixed and conflicting signals. He says that if you add a third momentum indicator, it's not going to make you any better. right? It's only going to make it more confusing and more difficult to get a clear trading signal. Okay. What he means by non-correlated is if you have one that's based off of trend, you should not be using another one based off trend. If you're using one for momentum, you should not be using one for momentum. If you're using for trend strength, and again, there's a lot of different types, you know, volume-based indicators, you don't want to use two of the same thing. But what I think is great is he's telling you that, listen, this is provide just one, one, you know, again, volatility is the main thing that it's looking at. It's providing one insight. Find something else that you can use this as whether um, kind of a confirmation. And again, this is how I use them, right? I'll look at them and I'll throw them on there, but it's not a primary. It's a secondary look, okay? That's Bollinger Bands. This is the easy part. Everybody should be good at this point. If not, go ahead and type questions in the chat and I can answer them for you. But now we're getting to more of the advanced tools, right? 
So John created Bollinger Bands back in the 1980s. And a funny story, he didn't even have a name for them. He was on the Financial News Network, and he was talking about them. And one of the newscasters said, so what are we calling these? We're going to call them Bollinger Bands? And that's where they got their name, right? Well, years later, and actually this is you know much, much more recently, right? Not in the 80s. This was like in the early 2000s, I think. John created two more additional tools called Bollinger Band or BB With and BB Percent B. Okay. But don't worry, there's not a test on what they all mean. <laughs> but basically what it is is Bollinger Band Wix is it's taking the difference between the upper and the lower bands and dividing it by the middle band, right? There's a tendency for the bands to alternate between expansion and contraction. So if you look at the indicator at the bottom, you see how it's just like a, a line, right? It's almost like a line chart. If you look at the top, as we have the squeeze, the line is going down. As we have the expansion, particularly if you guys can see the, the green circle, I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but kind of the third, the third line in, as it's starting to expand, right? We had that squeeze and it's breaking out. You're starting to see it explode, right? You're starting to see it going higher, okay? So it's one of those tools that you can use. It's very, very easy to see when the bands are contracting and starting to expand again. And they tend to go back and forth. Just like in a regular market, we see what? Impulse correction, impulse correction, impulse correction. This is expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. So it's one of those ones that kind of shows you in a very, very easy, you know, in looking at the, the three bands with the candles behind it, sometimes it's like, well, I don't know, is it getting, is this a squeeze and not a squeeze? So it's a way to start, start, you know, start showing you that um, the market's starting to move. And again, is it delayed a little bit? Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Okay. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Now, Bollinger Band Percent B is actually my favorite of these two. The width, I don't use really as much. It's one that I'll throw it up there. I have, I'll, I'll show you guys how to put it on a chart. And it's handy. And there are specific rule sets, but it's not. It's starting to go two or three steps down for confirmation for me. I, you know, I'm not, I don't throw that many on there, but it is one that John will throw on with his. But Bollinger Band Percent B, I believe, is an extremely helpful tool, especially if you like your charts clean. Uh, you guys know I like my charts clean. I am, I'm really, I literally will, you know, I'll throw fibs on there to help you guys out and I'll, you know, I'll throw horizontal, you know, rectangles. For the most part, that's it. I don't want anything else up there. I don't want any additional lines. I don't want anything else up there. I, I just want those and I want my alerts, right? What Bollinger Band percent B is, is it plots the closing price as a percentage of the upper and lower bands. Now, remember, the upper and lower bands, they change, right? They are adaptive. They're moving, right? So what it does is it plots a percentage. If it's, you know, the upper band is identified as a 1, the middle band is a 0.5, and, a, you know, the lower band is a 0. And what happens is price moves back and forth between that 1 and that 0 time frame. But it can break above, right? When it breaks above... What is it? What it's doing is it's breaking above. And you can see right here. If you guys can see it, the third stripe in, you have a break above. You can see it's breaking out of the bands to the top side. Okay. Again, the nice thing about this one, and this is the this is the really kind of where I got into the indicator. This is one of the only indicators that can signal both strength and direction. Right. When we look at a lot of the uh, the momentum strength, like some of the RSI stuff, or you know um, the ADX, you're talking about trend strength, but it's not really direction. This one is showing you where the direction is. So it's kind of like a mini chart inside of a mini chart. It's telling you when the bands are breaking. It's showing you in relation to the top and the bottom and even the middle of where price currently is between the bands. So if you like the idea of Bollinger Bands, knowing that things are statistically moving where they shouldn't be, this is a great little tool. It's clean. It's simple. It's easy. It's showing you trend. It's telling you, you know, trend strength. And it's kind of like, in, in all essence, it's really like Bollinger Band, like version 2.0 is really what it comes back to, right? Um, and again, if you're going to use any of these things, a lot of people don't know how to, you know, they don't use them necessarily correctly. But again, knowing we were out of that range, awesome job. It's it, it just, it's, it just, it's just, it's cool, right? Um, and again, it's applying statistics to your side. Now, uh, in talking about that, you know, we talked about overlapping systems, all right? Like I said, John Bollinger, he suggests using Bollinger Bands with two or three other non-correlated indicators that provide market direction signals. Now, there's a number of different things out there, right? A number of different ones. I would say probably the most popular one, and again, I don't, I don't use this one. I feel like it's used wrong a lot of times. And again, it's just, it's becoming, it's becoming too indicator focused for me. You know, again, I'm definitely a reading the candles, you know, I'm I'm reading candlesticks. And again, supply and demand is number two up here. But the number one strategy that people kind of you know overlap this with is RSI. Okay. Number two, 
supply and demand. This is my realm. Now, John Bollinger, he likes to talk about this David Bastian's intraday intensity. Um, I'm not using I'm not using that. You guys know what I'm using. Um, you know, supply and demand zones, what I teach my students. Uh, I use it with that. And then what I, I do it kind of supply and demand first, and then I'll throw Bollinger Bands on top of it to, for a little bit more confirmation, right? Third one is MACD, right? Uh, Stochastics is another one that a lot of people will do it with, although it's not one of the ones that's recommended by Bollinger, because remember we talked about non-correlated indicators. One of those things where people are like, oh, I know what Stochastics is another cool name. Just say it, Stochastics, right? So people throw that on charts all the time. They're like, yeah, it's going to show me oversold, overbought. Yeah, you know, it's, it is it is what it is. Um, not one of the recommended ones, but people still will try to, you know, it's kind of like oil and water, right? <laughs> it's not recommended, but people will try it. Uh, next one are FIBs, right? Could you use a Fibonacci retracement overlapping with a Bollinger Band when you know price necessarily shouldn't be there, that something happens special? Could you use that as some type of a confirmation? Sure, absolutely, right? Absolutely. So again, FIBS is another great one. And then any other leading indicator, something like pivot points, because again, pivot points are kind of the same thing. Supply and demand and pivot points, people kind of use those interchanges. It's kind of like if it hits this level, it should roll back again, right? Now, pivot points are a little bit different. There's a mathematical calculation for it. A lot of um, a lot of different charting softwares will have it where it'll do S1, S2, S3. You know, it kind of does like a support and resistance based off a of price. You can use that as well, right? And again, that kind of goes back into the, is your reversal point going to be supply and demand? Is it going to be a FIB retracement? Or is it going to be these, you know, these pivot points? Uh, another one is multiple time frame analysis, right? If you're not big in all these indicators, what you can use is, you know, you can use, and again, if you don't know what I mean by multiple time frame analysis, it is using the same chart, but using different time frames to analyze what is the, because again, if you know what the major trend is and you can drop it down to a lower time frame, time frame and find a reversal, what do they tell you, right? Buy on the pullbacks, sell on the pullbacks. It's all about the pullbacks, right? Overall, if we are in a down or in an uptrend, right? But on the lower time frame, using your Bollinger Bands, you see that we are kind of pushing too far to the downside. Now, all of a sudden, there could be a nice little way for you to take this one long based off of multiple time frame analysis. So it's not using other indicators, it's just using major time, you know, the larger time frames and pullbacks, right? Or you can do the same thing. You could use them, you know, you could use trend on the larger time frames, use a FIB retracement on the lower run, and then throw, you know, uh, you know, Bollinger Bands on top of it. Um, you could use pivot points on the same thing. You know, listen, it's it's sitting higher, it's sitting low. Because uh, again, there's a lot of ways you can use Bollinger Bands to get in, whether it, it be the on a fundamental basis, you're not supposed to just take it when it goes outside of the range. Depending on what was the catalyst for it, I'm I'm okay with that um, if it matches up with other things. There are other ways to actually trade it, you know, and again, I'll explain those in one second. But people will use Bollinger Bands, not so much as the break, right? A lot of people see it and they say, hey, listen, you know, uh, let me go back one. A lot of people will see it. Whoops, right there. A lot of people will see the Bollinger Bands and say, oh, it's hitting the bottom. I should go long, right? Uh, yes and no. There are ways to take this where you run it to the downside, right? So you could use it as a confirmation as a trend continuation as well. So it kind of gets fun depending on, you know, what your kind of um, confirmation, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Depending on what you use it for confirmation, there's some really, really cool things you can do with it. But again, a lot of it is based off of what your main strategy is. So let's talk about kind of um, really kind of tweaking the defaults, right? Told you guys already what it is is it's typically a 20 period, right? Now, this is where it gets a little bit, again, a little bit more advanced, right? Typically, it's your 20 period, and it's two standard deviations above and below, okay? Well, this is one of the things that is very, very common to do. Why not create multiple bands, right? So what people will do here, and I don't know if you guys can see it or not. Again, if you can see the blue, you can. Uh, again, trading view, you guys can see the BB20 close and then the 1010 up top, right? What that means is instead of just one set of bands, instead of doing the two standard deviations, what I have in this case is a one standard deviation line and a two standard deviation line. You may say, why would I do that? Well, I'm trying to create channels on the outside, okay? What I'm looking for is, again, I'm, you know, this is a great example of this big kind of draw. As it breaks down and it's sitting in that outer band, what that means is statistically, hey, listen, we're kind of at the extreme range, but it can continue to ride this range. It's not necessarily out, but it's in a range right now where it's between one and two standard deviations, which is an area where, you know, things can trend. And if you follow this, you can see here right in the middle, 
as this started to push down, it continued to drop and drop and drop and actually went outside a little bit and went to continue to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And again, uh, had you taken this, and again, I don't know if you guys can see the blue square or not, but if you look at this and the, let's see what column is it? One, two, three, four, five columns over, right? Right under the E and multiple. If you go all the way down, there's that green candle that popped out. A lot of people are like, well, why didn't you go long there? It broke out. You could, right? But that's not what we're trying to show here. What we're trying to show is what is the overall kind of tendency when we're between band one and band two, and you can see how much it ran down, right? And then it came back up and it rode the middle. And what did it do? It came out the other side, and then it rode high, 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 and then pulled back, and there wasn't really a whole lot. There's a little bit of chop back and forth, and you know, depending on your time frame, you, know, you could have looked at that. And it did it again, a little bit low, and then came back up and did it again up the top side. So it's one of those things. Is it perfect? Is it going to work 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And again, no indicator is going to work 100% of the time. No strategy works 100% of the time. The only thing that's 100% is if you don't get into the market, it's obviously it's not going to work for you. That's about the only 100% guaranteed thing there is out there. All right. But again, it serves as a guide. And again, if you want to throw in some multiple time frame analysis, also a very, very cool thing you can do. And what is this? This is an indicator that is using statistics, the bell curve, basically what everything we do in life as a way to find direction and trade entries. And it's the exact opposite of what you would think. Because again, people see Bollinger Bands are like, wait a second, I'm going long, I'm going short. And those do pop up. But again, this is a little bit different finding trends, right? That's just one way you can use them. Number two, you can actually change the standard deviation to three. And they say, why would I change the standard deviation to three? Well, here's why. If you look at the bell curve, you know how many are supposed to be under one standard deviation. You know how many are supposed to be under two standard deviations. So if it's able to break it at three, what are the chances that it's going to be able to break through? Not as high, right? As you can see, you'll get a whole lot less signals. I mean, you got one over here where it broke and it pulled back, right? And this was close, but it wasn't quite there. And came through again, and there's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a pop here. It, didn't, it kind of closed above, and it, and it rolled, right? Here's one right here. This one, again, didn't necessarily work on this one. You took a small stop out, right? which is fine. And then we go across and then all of a sudden, look at it. We did it right here. And what did it do? Rally, 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 rally. And then you can see this one wrote on the inside and didn't trigger again. So is it 100% of the time? No. But by changing the actual number of standard deviations, once again, it also does some cool things. And again, if you, if you use this on top of another strategy as well, that, hey, listen, I love the buying here. Maybe this is a fib pullback. You know that this is out of the ordinary. That's kind of how you add this in. And again, it's just one of the different parameters you can change. Okay. Now, here's another one. How about this? This is something else we can talk about. You may say, wait a second, what the heck is a Keltner channel? This is kind of the same idea, the same principle. You say, wait a second, there's three things over there, there's two over here. What the heck is going on? It's the same exact chart, guys. But what I did is I use a Bollinger Band versus a Keltner channel. So it's the same kind of idea. And you can see, look at the squeeze. Remember we talked about squeeze? Look at the squeeze on the left-hand side. The first close is this big green candle and it went boom, 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 all the way up. And then what did it do? It squeezed, it squeezed, it squeezed, and then bam, closed outside of it and tanked all the way back down to the downside. And again, squeeze, 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 closed outside, ran all the way back up again, all right? So again, tackling up for Bollinger Bands, right? Now, a counter channel is very, very much like a Bollinger Band. The only difference is, instead of a simple moving average in the middle, it uses an EMA. But what it does now, instead of using standard deviations, because you'll see, it looks much more steady, right? For the most part, it, it almost looks like a road, right? Not this big kind of whatever this is over here, right? It uses ATR. You guys know how much I love ATR. So this is kind of another variation on it, where people will use a counter channel saying, hey, listen, this is the standard ATR based off of the moving average. If it goes outside of it, that's out of the ordinary. That's not what we see. Wait a second. Red flag. It's not supposed to move that much. It's breaking ATRs. And again, what people will do is they'll take a Keltner channel and throw it on top of a Bollinger Band. And that's where they start to see entries where you can see, oh, my God, something's happening. It's moving because, again, you don't really have the squeeze. But if you get the squeeze and you see the ATR blowing up here, it can kind of give you profit targets. So just another kind of cool way they use the same exact principles. Um, how do you use my Bollinger Band for multiple bands on Nadex? Daryl, that's an awesome question. The answer is on the Nadex platform, we can't. <laughs> that's unfortunately, it's kind of basic. Uh, that's why I said that's why I'm showing this on Trading View, and I'll show you how to do it inside of Trading View. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna hate to differ with you. <laughs> you can't 
you can customize it. Um, when you've got Bollinger Bands up there, if you click B-O-L-L on the lower left side of the chart, you'll see there's a little box. You can customize your period and you customize your standard deviations. You can even customize how it all looks. But you can't put extra bands, right? Oh, you can't put extra bands. No, you yeah. can't use extra bands, but you can't customize. Oh, I'm sorry. He's asking about three standard deviations. My oh, there. Yeah, I thought you, could, you were saying, how do you do the extra bands like this? I thought uh, you were talking about this. This you cannot do on, on Natix. The three, correct. yeah, sure. You can change it to one you deviation. Can change the you can change it to two. Yeah. yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. All right. Yep, no problem. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, yeah, you can't, you can't, unfortunately, you can't do this. And And honestly, of all the ones out there, um, I, I I love this one. I think this one is a really, really great one, especially if you're new to it, especially when you know how to control risk, you know, um, and there's a lot of examples in here that I think are, you know, good examples to play. But it, again, just it's how you change them. And like I said, I like the Keltner channel, too, because, again, the ATR is, is kind of cool. All right. So with that said, I'm going to go over into charts now. We're going to talk about, you know, some of the different ways that you can kind of tweak them because I want you to see. Right. Um, Chevron. Besides Bollinger Bands, what are my go-to indicators? The answer is none. I don't. I don't really use indicate. If I had to, if I had to pick an indicator, I would say Fibs, but I'm not a big indicator guy. Um, I prefer just kind of supply and demand and drawing. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So, well, I guess ATR. I can say ATR. I, I love ATR. That's a that's a good one. So here you go, guys. I've stripped. This is S and P 500. I've stripped it just so you guys can see it. So we're inside a trading view. You should all still be able to see this, right? Um, and again, it's in every single one. What you can do with it really varies. Uh, and there's some tweaks, right? So indicators, if you go down and you click technicals, I, it should be the first thing that you see, right? I mean, if you can, you know, you can see all of them, Bollinger Bands, Bollinger Band percent and, and width. So your standard Bollinger Bands, there you go. You guys know what this looks like. Um, you know, and again, just looking at it right now, you know, there's a little fake out on the squeeze right here, but you got a little squeeze right here. And what happened? It broke out and look at this run. This is a nice little run here from the squeeze, the breakout. Look at that run to the downside. Right. Uh, if you guys were looking for something, you know, if this is where our risk was, since they said it's supposed to be in the other side of the squeeze, I guess we'll do it to there. Right. That was a one to six point six risk to reward ratio trade. That's a great trade setup, right? Great trade setup on the squeeze. And you see a little bit of a squeeze over here. And, and you know, again, let's go with the standard bull and grabans for us. Right. So there's your standard. Right. Now, if you wanted to tweak it, all you do is double click on it. Whoops. There we go. Let's cancel that one. And you can do anything you want. If you don't like the colors, you can change the colors. You can also put the inputs. And this is what Todd was talking about. You can change the standard deviations. And again, there's a hit here, a hit here, a hit here. If you change this to three, you will notice that it will, whoops, did, I, did it work? It's three. Yeah, there we go. You're going to get less hits, right? So in reality, this big spike down here never really triggered. There's a spike here, right? Spike here. And what did it do? It went to the top side. But do you see how there's less and less spikes, less and less going through? So if you feel like you're getting too many different signals on your chart, this is how you start changing it uh, around, right? So let's go back again, all right? So let's change that back to the, the standard deviation of two, okay? Now, if you wanted to do that double, like I talked about, right? You may say, well, wait a second, Brian. I, I really like that one and that two. There's only one option in here, and you're right. So let's change this one to one, okay? Now let's throw it on a second time, and you put a second Bollinger Band on. Now you have your double lines. And again, if you want to, you know, change this one around, you can change the visibility and we're going to change this to, I guess we'll do this red color. Yeah, we'll do red and then uh, the center one can stay the same, right? Oh, it's the, actually it's the color that I wanted to change. Uh, it's this one right here. Um, actually, I wanted to change the other one. doesn't matter. There we go. That's, that's enough. You guys can see that now we have this yellow zone on the outside. And what do we talk about? You get a close, you know, you get a close outside, right? And it drove down and really until over here, right? But again, its first close was there. So there you got that much wind so far, right? Then you're looking through and there's a little bit of close here and maybe you could stop that on this one, right? Maybe, right? Again, where that is, depending on the time at 930, probably wouldn't want to trade this right at 930. A little, a little risky there, right? At 930, right at the open, eh. Here you go at, at, at you know, 5 p.m., right? There's your close. And again, maybe, maybe you, you trade this one, maybe not. It didn't hit the center line. Look at the winner on that one. Right. And again, over here, a little chop out, but again, it's 930 in the morning. Do you want to trade the very opening candle? Because there's always volatility on that one. Eh, probably not. But what it's doing is it's showing you now. I mentioned the multiple time frame analysis. What is it? What if this was like, a, I don't know, like a four hour time frame? OK, four hour time frame. You could take it as this. If you're looking for a trend indicator, you could say that, listen, really, 
from here down, this is all considered a downtrend. And we really didn't break the middle, but you know, really from here to here, we're inside of a downtrend. So anytime we get a pullback, I'm looking for some way to get short. And then you can take it, you can drop it down to your lower bands. And then even from down here, you can start saying, all right, I'm looking for short opportunities. Every This whole area, I'm looking for short opportunities. And even if you just did the pierce, here's a pierce right here, right? There's a pierce and it continued to drop, right? Coming through again, there's a little pierce kind of over there, right? There's a, a good pierce and you can see that it continued to drop. Looking again, there's a pierce and it continued to drop, right? Looking again, you could say that there's a pierce. It's through a little bit. It didn't close above, but there's a pierce. It dropped. There's a pierce and it dropped. But what did I do? I used Bollinger Bands to tell me what I should be looking to do, whether it be long or short. I took the trend and then went from there, right? So again, I'm not looking for just the pierces. I'm combining Bollinger Bands on two different time frames, looking for the reversal and the reversion back to the mean, right? Cool or cool, right? A lot of cool stuff you can do with it. All right, so let's pull these off, right? Let's. Um, we're just going to delete all these. Uh, we're going to delete this. 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 Let's just throw our standard Bollinger Bands on there so you guys can see it, right? You're all pros at Bollinger Bands at this point. You got it. You figured it out. So let's add one step further. Let's go down and let's look at the percent B. Uh, we'll do width first, okay? There is the width, and this is a great example. So look right here, okay? Perfect example of this one. Here's where we start to see the expansion. What do we see up here? You see how we went from this little tiny squeeze to the expansion, 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 wider, wider, wider. So again, it gives you a gauge when volatility is starting to, or, you know, the, the volatility is starting to pick up and we're starting to see movement. Kind of a strength one, right? Now, pull on your band width for me. It's okay. I, you know, I don't throw a lot of these on. This is the one that I, I use the least amount. I feel it's helpful if visually you don't want to kind of look at this. And again, if you are doing the squeeze, you know, I think, I, I believe you can do it with this one. Some software, you can throw like a line down here. Um, you can set this line at, at kind of point 0.2, right? When it's, uh, I'd say point 0.2 is probably the, the ideal mark. And then if you set an alert when it breaks through it, you could do something cool like this. Like, hey, listen, when it's starting to accelerate and go above that point 0.2 area, I want to know, right? So you can create an alert that says when this line comes above, when it starts to expand, let me know. I need to look at this one and do my analysis. Kind of a cool function, right? Uh, let's delete that. And let me delete this. Now let's go to the other one, which I think is actually kind of a hidden gem that like nobody ever talks about, right? Kind of the same idea here, right? Now you can't really tell that it's squeezing here, right where my, 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 my cursor is. You can't really tell. I mean, it's going sideways. So you're like, yeah, it's in there, right? It doesn't really show you how wide it is. And that's why I wouldn't say the percent B is perfect. But look, there's your squeeze and there's your spike above. Now, it kind of advanced a little bit. And this was one of those situations where I'd be like, you know, technically it broke out. Shouldn't you have gone long? Yeah, probably, right? I mean, but it was breaking out to the top side. Look how much it broke out of the top, which is kind of more the, yeah, it went way outside. But look at this. You can see the spike down here outside. You know, is it, is it is a signal? Is it saying, hey, listen, bam, it's time to go long? No, that's not what it's doing. But it is telling me that statistically it's in a place that it probably not not shouldn't be. But it shouldn't be, right? Um, same thing. You can see the pierce here. It broke through. And then what did it do? It rode, 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 rode. And it's showing you that it's continuing to ride, 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 ride. And eventually it turns short. And this is why you need confirmations with other things, right? So a lot of fun things you can do with this one. Uh, I mean, kind of the same thing we had. Let's see if I can get a good example. Here's a perfect example, right? So one of the ways you could use this, this was back on the 19th. You guys know that I love my supply and demand. There's my level. There's my testing of supply and demand. Here's an opportunity where not only did it come up in a supply and demand, it's a tested level for me. It's also piercing after this little kind of hiccup saying, whoa, look at that. And again, do I need Bollinger Bands for this? Nope. I could remove my Bollinger Bands. I could look at this. I could set an alert down here and say, hey, listen, if this breaks above one, if it breaks above one, I want to know about it. Tell me when it breaks the top side of that band. And bam, there you go. It must be. It must have just hit it. Yeah, look, it's coming through right now, right? In this opportunity, it's not only a, a supply zone for me, right? Right. Uh, let's see. Mark that there. Let's go to a four hour here. My four hour window. If I throw my my Bollinger Bands in right now, look at this. Bollinger Bands in. Oh, look at this. I'm on the downside. Look at this. I'm coming through. I'm below the center line. 
I should be looking to go short because remember from really it's the close was from over here, but we'll do this one. This whole area I'm looking to go short. Drop it down to my 30 minute time frame. I see that I have a supply zone right there. You know, and again, could I use just my supply zones and say, hey, I don't want anything to do with this and I don't want anything to do with Bollinger Bands? Yeah, I, should, I could. But what it does is this is about stacking the odds in your favor. I know that it's tested right there. I know that there was no sellers above because it turned price away. I also know that I'm outside of this area now, right? My Bollinger Bands are saying, hey, something's going on. We are now piercing, right? We're piercing a band at a supply zone. It's just another way to kind of stack it in there and say, you know, and if it was just flat like this, is it a, a big, you know, not really, but again, just more confirmation to the downside. And it shows me down here as well. Listen, we breached it. We went above what the normal is. This is abnormal price action. Abnormal price action into an area of sellers. I'll take it every day of the week. And again, that was a nice little run to the downside. Uh, what are you talking about? 100 and 150? Is that 150 points? Yeah. 150 points to the downside based off of that one. In what? Um, nine, nine, four, in four hours? That's a heck of a move. And then what did it do? It went across and tagged the center line right there. So this, uh, you know, setting this one up from that zone. Uh, let's see. Uh, there. And let's see. When it finally ran back into the zone right there, that was a 1 to 5.76 risk of reward based trade. So does it need to work every single time? Nope. Nope. But as long as you have to find risk levels, you overlap it like, uh, you know, John Bollinger says. Um, you know, it's a fun little tool. And like I said, one of the reasons why I like it, um, you know, here's another example. Okay. This morning, uh, had you drawn fibs, right? We knew that we had a 50% retracement level. We talked about it earlier today in Todd and I's session. And I was like, it's not, it doesn't, for me, it, it ideally doesn't line up, right? It's, it's not in the best of areas. It's a little bit shy for me. It's close. It's close. You know, use some multiple time frame analysis. You can say, hey, wait, wait a second. If I drop it down, I can see where that price action actually is. Um, you can see it's it's more sitting in that level right here. And what did it do? It came down, it tagged it, it pierced the band at my supply supply and demand zone. It happened to be at a 61 weight. Remember, most FIB traders are getting in at 50, getting stopped out at 61.8. But what did it do? There's your trade setup, right? You had a pierce of a band at an area where we had buyers in the past. And again, I can bring it back up to 15. That's where we would have seen it in the first place, right there. Uh, actually, it would have been there. And there's the, there's a reversal for this morning. By the way, also reverse at 10 o'clock. If you don't know what that means, make sure you attend the morning sessions because I talk about 10 to 10.30 every morning. But there you go. And right now, right now, it's a 1 to 8.7. For every one that you risk, you've made 8.71 profit. Isn't that cool, guys? And this is what advanced technical analysis is. And what is it? It's, it's a supply zone or it's a demand zone at the pierce of a band, which I know is a no-no, at a 10 o'clock reversal time frame. Love it. Look at that rally. Look at that rally. And now the VIX is actually even negative. And the VIX was huge. Everybody's like, today is going to be a horrible day. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right? Awesome, awesome stuff. So that's it for us today. Uh, it is already 2.50. It's amazing how fast time flies when you're having fun with it. As I said, this is, you know, Bollinger Bands is one of those things. If you want just a little bit more certainty, Again, throw some statistics in there. If the statistics and the odds are in your favor, it's always a better way to trade. Again, you're still able to protect, protect yourself, you know, using a product like Natix to get that risk in there. Um, if you guys have any questions, you're more than welcome to type it in chat. You know, Todd will answer it. Um, you can email me, support at keeptradingsimple.com. If you want to see this in, in action, kind of how that trade setup would have worked, again, attend our morning sessions. Go to YouTube, go to Natix, hit the follow, the, 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 you know, the, the, the subscribe, the join, right, the join button. And uh, hit the notification bell, right? You do that every time we go live in the morning, you'll get a notification that comes to, you know, on your desktop, your phone. It says, hey, listen, Brian and Todd are going live. They're going to do some analysis and these type of things we'll cover. So with that, I'm out of here. Thank you guys so much for attending. And Todd, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Brian, for that. And I do want to repeat again, on the Nadex YouTube channel, every morning, 7.45 a.m., Brian and I go live on a live stream. Go to YouTube. Follow Nadex, subscribe to the channel, join us, 7.45 a.m. Eastern every day. And if you're not able to make it, the recording is immediately available so that you can watch it at your convenience.